Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Welcome to the Sound Bites Podcast. This is a two part series on strength, the principles of strength, fueling strength, and strength in action. Ultimately, how strength can help you to be your best self. So, I interviewed three different guests. First is Dr. Mike Roussel. He's a research scientist, a protein expert, and the author of the new book, Strength the Field Manual. Second, I interviewed Amy Livingston. She's an Olympic weightlifter, food blogger, and recipe developer, and also a breast cancer survivor. And third is Lance Pekus, the Cowboy Ninja. He's a regular competitor on American Ninja Warrior and a cattle rancher with a degree in natural resources and environmental science. In these two episodes, we discuss what strength means to each guest. We talk about physical strength, but also mental and emotional strength. We discuss the four cornerstones of eating to support strength and some practical tips for tweaking your meals and snacks, as well as simple cooking ideas and meal prepping advice. And we also talk about life on a cattle ranch and how both the land and the animals are cared for. This series is a collaboration with Beef It's What's for Dinner and is part of my role as a compensated member of the Beef Expert Bureau which is a program of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, a contractor to the Beef Checkoff. So stay tuned because we talk about so much more than beef in these three interviews. I hope you'll enjoy these two episodes and be sure to check out the free book, Strength the Field Manual. Digital and hard copies are available at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. And be sure to stay tuned to the end of the episode for some announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Joy Dobbins, a registered dietitian nutritionist. And on my show, we delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. And this is part two in a series about strength, and in particular, Strength, the Field Manual, which is a book written by Dr. Mike Roussel. I had a lengthy conversation and a lively conversation with him getting into the book and what strength means and his background and his research. So today, I wanted to kind of take a more culinary focus with my fellow Beef Expert Bureau member and friend, Amy Livingston. Welcome to the show, Amy. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation. Now, you are the wellness blogger behind Amy's Savory Dish, which is a healthy living site focused on nutritious, quick and easy meals. You are also a certified personal trainer through the National Academy of Sports Medicine and a cancer exercise specialist at Fight Back Performance and Recovery. Now, we're going to talk a lot about your background and your journey and a lot about culinary stuff, but I just have to say that I have so enjoyed working with you for the past several years on the Beef Expert Bureau. Whenever we get into the kitchen and we have our little culinary activities. I'm always looking over your shoulder uh, (laughs) because I learn a lot from you. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. And I should mention this episode is sponsored by the Beef Council. And both Amy and I, as Beef Expert Bureau members, really have a wonderful opportunity as paid consultants with the Beef It's What's for Dinner, um, National Cattlemen's Beef Association, to attend immersion events and learn about the science and the research on beef nutrition, and also agriculture practices. And we share this information out with our audiences, whether it's through a recipe like Amy, like you develop, or it's through you know different blog posts or podcasts like this. So I'd like to just jump right in and find out a little bit more about your background, how long ago and why you started your blog, and really how you got interested in food and nutrition in the first place. My blog, Amy Savory Dish, was born in 2010. That's when I was just getting an itch to do something creative. I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. My daughter had just started kindergarten. 
just wanted an outlet for sharing my love of food and cooking. I really didn't love cooking until I got married and I just started learning a lot from family and my mother-in-law's a great cook. She was teaching me a lot about Southern cooking. I am from the South, obviously. (laughs) And so I love Southern food and the Southern food culture, but it's not exactly the healthiest food. So I was taking recipes and tweaking them to make them more nutritious. And friends were asking me for the recipes. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to start a blog and share everything there. And that was nine years ago. And I've had so many great opportunities from this blog. So it's been a great adventure. I know you have a food philosophy that I'd like you to share with our listeners that I really think is wonderful. My philosophy around food nutrition is, in a nutshell, nourish daily and splurge occasionally because I believe that, you know, the bulk of your diet should be good whole foods full of micronutrients and quality protein, healthy fats. But I think it's okay to, if you want a cupcake to eat a cupcake. You know, treats on occasion are part of enjoying food with others for special occasions. And it's really how I live. Um, it's me being very, um, what's the word, authentic, I guess, with my audience. I'm not going to show, uh, yes, I am a personal trainer, but yes, I eat a cupcake. You know, I want them to see that my diet is very balanced. I don't really subscribe to any certain dietary dogma or, <laughs> I mean, there's plenty of that on the internet, but, you know, I've been through diet phases on my blog. You can kind of see my nutrition evolution over the years, but I've pretty much learned to focus more on how food makes me feel than obsessing over food rules, quote unquote, and just adhering to dietary restrictions. I compete in a weight class sport in Olympic weightlifting, and um, sometimes it's necessary to cut back and dial it in when I need to for competing. But for the most part, I just like to eat. I enjoy food, and um, I just focus more on preparation and working with whole foods and getting a lot of that in, a lot of vegetables, a lot of quality proteins and nuts, seeds, healthy fat sources. And then it's okay if I have some processed foods here and there. It's a good balance. And we are going to talk a lot about your own personal workout strategies in addition to your work as a personal trainer. So let's talk about what strength means to you. And I know it's it's more than just exercise. You know, you mentioned the Olympic weightlifting and my cousin does that. And I understand it's different from powerlifting. So I want to hear a little bit about that. But what does strength mean to you? When I think of strength, of course, you have your your physical strength that embodies your exercise, your movement, your nutrition, nourishing the body. And then you have your mental aspect of strength, which someone's grit, um, the hard work, perseverance over obstacles in someone's life and just pushing yourself despite limitations. Those two things to me kind of make up strength as a whole. Yeah, I agree. You know, I think when we hear the word strength and this field manual that Mike Roussel wrote gets into all of the different aspects. It's not just exercise. It's not just fitness. Certainly there's a nutrition component and there's the mental component as well. How long have you been doing strength training? I started lifting in graduate school, actually, no, undergrad. And I feel like that is, you know, I do a variety of activity now, but looking back over my my life, that's the one type of activity that I think I've been most consistent with besides dance. And I feel like it's just so, it helps me be strong and it helps me be powerful. So I'd like to hear how long you've been lifting and how maybe that has evolved um, throughout your life as well. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll first answer that question. You had a question about the difference between powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting, which I love both. Uh, I don't compete in powerlifting. That's a whole other animal. But powerlifting, you do three main lifts. You do the bench press, the squat, and the deadlift. And then you compete for those three lifts, your power lifts. For Olympic weightlifting, you have two lifts that you complete, and you have three attempts at each in a competition. So it's the snatch and the clean and jerk. So basically, you spend years refining technique for two lifts. Wow. <laughs> but it's definitely not as easy as it sounds. It has been the biggest challenge for me uh, as far as you know fitness modality. I kind of got into that. I was introduced 
to Olympic weightlifting through CrossFit. I was really into CrossFit for a while and coached for a while. I started that in 2012, did that up to um, my cancer diagnosis, which I'll get into that in a bit. Um, And then in 2016, a friend of ours opened a, a barbell club and she was focusing exclusively on Olympic weightlifting. And to be honest with you, that was like the part of CrossFit I wasn't very good at. I'll admit, um, it was definitely a weakness for me, and I wanted to get better at it. So I decided to start exclusively learning technique and training for Olympic weightlifting. And as I did that, I loved it. And I thought, I don't know that I'm going to go back to CrossFit. I mean, I still do some CrossFit-ish workouts, but I don't exclusively do that anymore. I pretty much stick to Olympic weightlifting. And I've been working with a coach uh, for the last three and a half years. I've been working with a coach one-on-one for Olympic weightlifting, and my goal is to compete again. I've done some local competitions, and I did the Masters Nationals competition in Savannah a couple years ago, and I would love to do the Masters Nationals event in 2020, so that's kind of my goal, provided everything goes well and I don't fall apart. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit about my transition into Olympic weightlifting. It's really interesting. Well, thank you. It's been a lot of fun. I've loved fitness my whole life. Um, In my younger years, I did gymnastics. I did cheer throughout high school and college. It was mostly running in group fitness classes. And I'd say in my adult life, in my younger years, in my 20s and early 30s, I did a lot of running in group fitness. I'm trying to remember when it was, but back in the 90s, I believe, when Oxygen Magazine first came out. I don't know if you remember that magazine, mm-hmm. but it was a popular strength magazine focused on women. And I would cut out bodybuilding workouts and piece them together in, in a um, binder mm-hmm. <laughs> and go to the gym and make up my own strength workout. So I kind of DIY'd it mm-hmm. for a while until I got certified and actually learned okay, how I periodize programming and how this all works and how to put together a good program. So it's just been a big part of my life for a very, very long time. When did you get certified? 2012, I got a CrossFit Level 1 certification and started just teaching group classes at our gym. And then I got a CrossFit Endurance certification the following year. And then I did a certification with Precision Nutrition just to get, um, I wanted a good foundation um, education for nutrition just so I could have, you know, an intellectual conversation with someone about nutrition or just really for my own knowledge. um, So I knew how to fuel my body for these tough workouts I was doing. So I did that. And then I started working on my CPT so I could do more one-on-one coaching. Um, That was in 2015. And I tested and got that certification in 2016. And then I just added every year, I add more and more. In 2016, I also added three different certifications for cancer exercise. One is specific to breast cancer. And then last year, I got certified as a pre and postnatal coach through Girls Gone Strong, and they have an excellent program for that. So I kind of specialize in women's fitness and cancer exercise. So I guess maybe it's a good time to tell my story about cancer. Yeah, definitely. Please do. So in 2016, I had gone in for a routine mammogram. And at that point, I was doing a lot of competitive CrossFit training. Uh, My nutrition was totally dialed in. I was probably in the best shape of my life. And then I got a phone call after that mammogram that they found something suspicious. So they called me back um, for another screen, which was followed up by a biopsy. And then my surgical breast oncologist called, and he's actually a a friend of ours. He was my neighbor, so I knew him on a personal level. He called me at 9 o'clock at night. I thought, that's weird. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be calling me at 9 unless he had something really important to say. So he told me that, um, well, I have good news and bad news. He said, what do you want first? And I said, well, give me the bad news first. And he said, well, you have cancer. We found DCIS, which is ductal carcinoma in situ. And it's grade three, which is high nuclear grade. It's a very aggressive, fast-growing type of cancer. Good news is it's still within the ducts. So 
your treatment options are you can get aggressive with this since it is a more aggressive type of cancer and um, have a mastectomy or you can do a lumpectomy and then you can go through radiation and then if your lymph nodes are affected then we'll discuss chemotherapy options so obviously at that point in time i was dumbfounded and and just what is happening and um i just couldn't even i was just shocked um Mm. i thought how how someone like me so healthy right spends their life dedicated to eating healthy and and helping other people too. Like I felt like, how can I be an example for others if I can't even keep myself well? And so it really messed with my mind for a while. And I thought, you know, what did I do wrong? Like Mm -hmm. where, where did I go wrong? There's a a lot of um, pouring myself into research and studies and trying to learn everything I could about, you know, how you get cancer. Um, I did the genetic testing and I have no um, genetic predisposition for cancer. You said no family history. No family history, no family history at all. So, you know, I was shocked. We were shocked. My family was going through this all with me. You know, when you get cancer, your whole family gets cancer because mm. there it affects everybody. So it was a tough time. And I think the hardest thing for me going through all that is I've kind of lost trust in my own body. And I, you know, it's taken me a long time to get that back. And it's still a mystery, but (laughs) it's like being healthy and fit may have not prevented cancer, but it did have a huge impact on my ability to recover. And, you know, I just came down to the conclusion, we don't have the power to prevent disease, but what we do have within our power is our lifestyle. Well, we don't have control over, yeah, certain things in life. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And you're going to share uh, how, how nutrition and exercise helped you in, in your recovery. But I'm sure that your level of, of health, nutrition and physical fitness going in was very helpful, too. It was. I realized that quickly with my recovery that, no, it didn't prevent it, but it, it did make a big impact in how I healed and just bouncing back to my training it's been a rough road for sure that I've had a lot of setbacks and injuries just trying to train after. So I, I guess I should just briefly touch on my treatment. So over a year and a half, 2016 to 2017, I had three different surgeries. I opted for the bilateral mastectomy and because it was early, I was lucky enough to do nipple sparing, which cosmetically turns out great. And then I had immediate expanders put in at the time of my mastectomy. And then six months later, they swapped those out for implants. And then following that, I did a fat grafting procedure. So, you know, it was a year and a half of my life disrupted. Wow. And that was not the most fun. But I will say that two weeks after my mastectomy, I was at the physical therapist doing exercises and therapy to regain my range of motion. And um, I just want to say, if there's anybody going through cancer, listening to this breast cancer, I'm shocked at how many doctors don't refer their patients to physical therapy because Mm -hmm. it has such a huge impact on recovery. I know for me, people were floored when I told them, yes, I'm doing front raises two weeks after my mastectomy. I was surprised. Yeah. (laughs) I was chomping at the bit. I was driving my doctor crazy. Like, when can I exercise? Mm -hmm. You know me. I have to get in there. I couldn't wait. It was making me crazy not to. So exercise for me is my therapy. And I say that all the time. Like, it's good for your mental health. It helps you cope with these kind of things. It just gives you a better outlook. Feeling strong and working on that recovery is so important. So it's my saving grace (laughs) throughout Mm -hmm. cancer. I hope that people take note of that and don't wait till you're sick to get healthy. You know, do it now. Focus on those things in your life. Exercise, nourish your body, eat good whole foods, and then take time to Um, Mm de-stress. In hindsight, when I look back, I think my biggest issue was not enough stress management techniques in my life because I was always go, 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 and, you know, hard workouts, and (laughs) Mm -hmm. I would stretch. Push, push, push. Push, push. Yes, it's just my personality. It's my nature. I'm, I'm a very driven individual. So, 
that changed dramatically after cancer. I learned to be okay with taking a, you know, an extra rest day. If I would miss a workout, I would not freak out and I'd do more yoga, more meditation. I downloaded Headspace and started listening to that and I learned how to properly do diaphragmatic breathing and just really practicing that, not just talking about it with my clients, like some of these things I would tell my clients to do, and then I wasn't going home to do them. So I thought, I really need to make sure that I'm practicing what I preach on stress management and just that recovery aspect of training. So that's been the biggest takeaway for me is eating well, obviously continuing that and just de-stressing when I need it and listening to my body Mm. when it needs a break. Mm. Well, thank you so much for sharing that journey and that story. Um, It just is amazing. You know, I knew you before, during and after. um, And yeah, I was I was just so amazed at how quickly you were back at the workouts and just really impressed with your faith and your perseverance. And I remember your husband was really funny with with one of the social media posts too. He was kind of <laughs> shared a lot of humor about, you know, and it's such a trying time. Um, so I'm I'm just so glad that that everything's better now and that you are listening to your body and you regain that trust back in your body. Yes, and it's it's a process, but having the exercise outlet is huge. It really is. Mm-hmm. I love strength training, and I would tell everyone. Make sure it's a part of your life in some form, whether it's body weight, resistance training, or lifting weights, and get in, get your heart rate up every now and then. It's 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 yeah. healthy and good. We know it's good for muscles. We know it's good for bones. We know it's good for stress management and uh, weight management. It's all good. Yes. So let's switch over to our culinary focus. You are my culinary hero in a lot of ways. I look to you for like, okay, I just got this Instant Pot. What the heck do I do with it? Or, you know, you go to your website for different recipes and you really have gotten into some meal prep that comes along with the recipes and everything. Talk to us about why meal prep is so important and what people need to know, like if they're just getting started and in the strength, the field manual There is a section, um, Dr. Mike and I talked about it briefly, but I wanted to talk with you also about the meal prep section and the recipes in there. And again, people can get this book online at beefitswhatsfordinner.com. They can also order hard copies that are free. So I'll have the links and everything in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But why is meal prep so important? Oh, I love meal prep. It sets you up for success by planning and being prepared. No last minute bad decisions. You know, we all, time is sacred for everyone these days. Most people are busy. They don't want to spend, you know, back in the day, our moms and grandmas did the meat and three and we had this elaborate meal with all, you know, all these veggies and people don't cook like that anymore. People need fast, easy, but tasty. You want your food to taste good options. So I love meal prep. We've done it for years. And my husband, fortunately, loves to help out. So we kind of tackle it together. I'll usually do the indoor prep and we um, cook a lot of meat. So he'll do the grilling. And so that's one thing that has been great. And we've done it as a team. But I think that a lot of people hear meal prep or they see meal prep and everyone's got all their dishes out and they're loaded with food and they spend an entire day And they get this kind of paralysis by analysis, you know, thing. It's just like, oh, my gosh, that's so overwhelming. I'm not taking my entire Sunday to make food, you know. And believe me, I feel that way some weekends, too. So we've done the whole spectrum to where we've done the full-on meal prep. You know, maybe we're getting ready for competition and we've got to watch our weight. And so, you know, we'll have everything ready so we don't make a last-minute run for fast food or something that we shouldn't eat at that moment. And also we've done partial prep and that's something I wanted to talk about so that people don't feel like they have to prep their entire meals or for all of their meals, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, or even make entire dinners. There's ways that you can break it up to make it easier. And what I would say is ask yourself, what is your biggest obstacle? Maybe for some people it's getting 
high quality protein at breakfast. Maybe they run out the door in the morning and they don't stop to make a good breakfast, but there are options there. You can have your breakfast prepped. I love doing overnight oats layered in jars and I put a scoop away in there to get it in protein. I have a great recipe for Southwest egg muffins um, with beef and then that's loaded with protein and vegetables and you can grab a muffin and run out the door. You know, there are ways, yogurt parfaits, there are ways to kind of tackle that and have that ready, but those things take no time at all, very, very fast to prepare. So maybe start with just getting your breakfast and just tackle that and then go from there if you want to partially prep. I really like the idea of partially prepping. And I think that that seems like a better fit for me than uh, you know, like you said, well, I'm not going to spend all day Sunday or one full day a week, you know, prepping all these meals. But you talk about batch cooking proteins or like the overnight oats or pre chopping vegetables. And I think that maybe if somebody's starting out, that is a better way to kind of dip your toe in, into the meal prep uh, arena and kind of like you said, think about where's my biggest pain point? Is it getting, you know, a high quality breakfast or is it, you know, having a whole grain side dish or a vegetable like throughout the week and maybe thinking about batch cooking or prepping those particular items and not everything else. Right. And that's honestly for since we've moved to Charlotte, we moved here. It's been a year and a half. We haven't done the full meal prep. So we do a lot of partial prep. And most of what that involves is I'll hard boil a lot of eggs. And if you don't have an egg cooker, I highly recommend it because I love mine. Um, I have two egg cookers, so I can do 14 eggs all at once. And my daughter eats them too. She likes to grab them for a quick breakfast. So I'll keep a lot of hard-boiled eggs in the fridge for snacks and grab and go. And we batch cook our protein. So that is honestly our biggest issue is dinner. You know, I feel like breakfast and lunch are pretty easy for us to throw together. But dinner is where I don't. My husband and I train together in the evening. So as soon as he gets home from work, we go downstairs in our home gym and we work out for one to two hours, depending on what our workout is that day. So I'm not cooking dinner at that time. I want to have that free to train with him. So we'll do a lot of proteins at once. I buy my proteins in bulk to save money. You can shop your grocery store ads or go to price clubs, which is my favorite way to do it. And then you're buying several pounds at once. We almost always do lean ground beef. We'll patty it up into burgers or meatballs. And I also like to brown ground beef, but I'll do it in one pound servings. So that way I can grab a pound of ground beef out of the freezer that's already cooked and throw it in with a bag of frozen rice and veggies and just cook it all in a pot and it's good to go. It's easy. It's nutritious and literally takes five minutes. So that's one way we love to do it during the week is just having our proteins all done. Yeah. And you talk about, and I think this is really interesting and important. uh, So I'd like you to share it with the listeners. You talk about how storing your prepped proteins really makes a difference. So walk us through some examples. Okay, so the way we do it after we cook, we utilize different methods of cooking. Sometimes we'll bake things, sometimes we'll grill. A lot of times we grill our proteins and then we let it all cool and then wrap it up into um, plastic rack. If you have a food saver, you can vacuum seal your meats, which is great. Yeah, we got one of those, I don't know, maybe a year or so ago, and we love it. I don't know how to work it. My yeah. husband does it, but <laughs> we love it because getting that air out is really helpful in preventing freezer burn and just that loss of quality. Yes. So that's honestly the best way to do it and just vacuum seal all your proteins individually so you can just grab them and and heat them up. Another way to do it if you don't have that is I wrap them in plastic wrap and then we put it all in a freezer safe container and we freeze that and we take out what we need the night before, let it thaw in the refrigerator and then just heat it on the low heat in the microwave, not full on high heat. So if you cook it low and slow in the microwave, it will stay moist. 
another great way to do it is you could do it in a water bath. So take a pot on the stove and boil it and then drop the vacuum sealed bags of cooked meat in there and just let it heat that way. And that's going to probably be your best results for moist meat reheated. So that's another great way to do it. It's kind of that sous vide style. I'm going to have to try that. (laughs) Yeah. Getting frozen meat out the night before, I even if I think about it and plan ahead, it never fails. That particular day, something happens where our schedule changes. And I feel like, you know, throwing it back in the freezer, which Toby Amador, our fellow Beef Expert Bureau member (laughs) who wrote uh, the meal prep cookbook, she's like, don't do that, Melissa. You know, that's not good to thaw it and put it back in the freezer. I'm like, what am I supposed to do? (laughs) And she said, just go ahead and cook it up when you get the chance and then go from there. But I'm going to try this. uh, You said it's kind of a sous vide style reheating the meat. Yeah, just try the water bath and that works great. Ground beef, I find that, you know, I loved having ground beef in the freezer and it, that really doesn't matter. I put it in one of those Pyrex dishes with a lid and we usually use it fast enough to where it doesn't get freezer burn. So we don't ever have that problem, but I just throw it in spaghetti. Um, I have a great recipe for zucchini spaghetti on my site. That's something we eat all the time. We'll do a meat spaghetti sauce with either spaghetti squash or sometimes we'll do a little bit of pasta, but I like to have half and half. Usually I'll do half pasta, half zucchini noodles Mm. um, and kind of do it that way. I like the half and half idea. Yeah. And I did see that recipe on your site and it was like zucchini spaghetti with easy beef bolognese. And I... I'm a sucker for bolognese, and I never even thought about trying to make it myself. So I'm going to check that recipe out for sure. You should. I've tried several of your recipes. What was the Instant Pot one that I just asked you about? Because I have a new Instant Pot, and I'm just trying to figure out how to use it and what might be good recipes. And you had recommended one, Mediterranean beef. Yeah, it was a um, Instapot Mediterranean beef, and that's one of our favorites. I love that recipe. Yeah, I'll put that in the show notes as well. I made it, I emailed you back and I said, yeah, it was really good. It was really yummy. Good. So some of the meal prep strategies in the book, Strength, the Field Manual, like I said, Dr. Mike and I talked about it, the modular meals, there's a salad matrix, and then there's the one cut multiple meals. Do you do anything? I mean, I know you're you're really great with recipe development and the meal prep. With the meal prep and and this batch cooking of proteins and things like that, do you do much with like, okay, I've got a roast here, so I'm going to do fajitas one night and like a stir fry the next night or a stew or something like that. Do you ever do anything like that with your recipes? I do that a lot, actually. So I do have a post on my website and it's meal prep ideas using flank steak and it's kind of utilizing it in different ways, which would kind of fall into that, Mm -hmm. what we're just talking about. And uh, as far as I love the salad matrix too, if anyone follows me on Instagram, I share a lot of things there that I don't necessarily put on my blog, like some of my meal prep things or some extra recipes or some fun weightlifting things. But I do salads a lot. That's one of the ways I prep my lunches because I eat a salad for lunch just about every day. I love salad. And the salad matrix is great because it tells you how to build it. And so a lot of times I'll do the handfuls of greens and then I'll do different salad variations for the week. So, you know, I might do beef one day, ham one day, chicken one day, and then switch up my toppings and put them in containers and I just grab those. If I'm working at the gym, I can just grab it and run out the door and I have lunch ready to go. But the salad matrix in the book is is fantastic. I actually haven't tried that. I've done that. I attended a, an immersion event at Barilla and there was this pasta builder, which is kind of similar. Like it's, you know, you start with the pasta and then you add a protein if you want, and then you add a vegetable. So this is similar, you know, you start with a certain type of lettuce and then you add different you know types of vegetables and you look at different types of protein and it things that you might not think of like quinoa adding that to your salad and pairing up different flavors you know so that you have some variety because even if you like salad and you eat it a lot uh, it can get kind of repetitive and kind of you know kind of get in a rut if you do the same toppings all the time 
Oh, for sure. For sure. That, I love to switch it up. I call myself the salad queen because I post my salads a lot <laughs> and I just love salad. And so salads to me aren't boring. They're tasty, but you have to know how to make them so that they are good and tasty and you want to eat them. You don't dread eating your salad for lunch. So I think how you build it for sure. Yeah. To me, sometimes it's about the salad dressing and learning to make just a simple tangy vinaigrette can make all the difference in the world. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. But there's some great recipes in the Strength Field Manual. And like I said, that's available online. And you can also order the hard copy book. But also there is a two-day meal plan strategy because they say, you know, sometimes it's easier to kind of follow a specific roadmap to kind of get started or get jump started. So if anybody's looking for like a two-day meal plan, there's also a full seven-day meal plan with recipes on beefitswhatsfordinner.com forward slash strength field manual. Now, you know, I have this do more with dinner initiative, which I talk about from time to time, because of course, I'm always working the program, I'm always doing it, whether it's trying a new recipe, or just trying to be present at dinner and have these fun conversations with my family. So I think you're the perfect guest to ask, how do you do more with dinner? What are some strategies that you share, whether it's culinary or conversational? I think it's really important to get your family to the table to have that conversation and enjoy dinner together on a regular basis. And I know with schedules, it's not necessarily going to happen every day. It might be a couple of times a week where you're not running to sports or whatever's going on. But it is important to get everyone sitting down. It's a great opportunity to talk to your family, your kids, see what's going on in their lives. It's always been very important to us. And, you know, one way we do more with dinner is my husband and I cook together a lot, which I love. And he actually knows how to cook, but he's kind of a spoiled man because I do a lot of the cooking, <laughs> but he will help with meal prep and he loves to grill. So, you know, we do that together and that's kind of our thing to do meal prep together. And as far as my kids go, I've always made it a point to get them in the kitchen. My son is not really a huge fan of cooking, but he gets involved. Mm -hmm. And I will say that I've finally gotten him. He's mastered scrambled eggs and uh, cheese quesadillas. So that is a good thing. So he will cook for himself. It's very basic. But now that he's in college, I feel pretty confident that he won't burn down his apartment and he can cook a couple of meals on his own. <laughs> um, but we've always gotten together in the kitchen. My daughter loves to cook, so she is the opposite. She makes her own meals most days. She likes to do her own thing, and I fully embrace that and encourage it. So getting kids in the kitchen, have them help out with preparation. That's one thing that's important for our family is you know, I want them to enjoy the process of cooking as well as eating. And I think they're more inclined to try foods if they're helping prepare them. So introducing new foods, getting them involved in cooking, visiting farms with your kids so they see where their food comes from. That's always been important to us so they can kind of see the process. So, yeah, that's kind of how we do more with dinner. We just the whole family gets involved with dinner time. And my daughter cooks for me sometimes, so it's pretty great. Oh, that's lovely. I really like that. <laughs> my daughter did that as well. And now that she's in her second year of college, it's it's funny. She will text me or you know, call me and say, I can't believe how little cooking knowledge some of my friends have or, you know, or they don't know how to clean a bathroom or something like that. And I'm like, okay, that makes me feel like I did my job. <laughs> right, right. So hopefully you'll hear some good stories too. I know he just went off to college. Wish him the best. Thank you. It's an interesting transition, but it's mm, great. It is. It's it's a little nerve wracking, isn't it? It is. It is for sure. But it's so wonderful when you get the good reports and you you see them thriving, and uh, it's just a great feeling. Yes. It's a fun time in your life going through college. Seems like my college years were yesterday. I know. So right? I, I don't know how I'm here, but I know. we are. And <laughs> so that's our life for the next eight years because our daughter, they'll overlap one year. She'll start college his senior year. So it's nice to have a little bit of a gap there so that they don't all go off at the same time. And 
Yes. <sighs> yeah, I know. My son just started sixth grade today, so I've got a little bit of time left. But yeah, I agree. I feel like my college years were just yesterday and uh, a little jealous because I know she's just having a, a great time and I hope your son does too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank- so far, so good. Well, thank you so much for sharing all this culinary advice and for sharing your story and your journey with us. I'm so glad that you're doing better and that, like I said, you've kind of regained that confidence and trust and listening to your body. I think that's really important. And I appreciate all the recipes. And in addition to the couple that we mentioned already, like I said, I will link to these in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. But I also saw that you've got a cheeseburger quiche that I'm going to try, a no sugar added fresh strawberry pie. And a summer peach frozen rosé, or I think you called it a frosé. So (laughs) frosé. You know, I'm not ready for summer to be over, so I'm going to try that for sure. (laughs) Yes, that it it was good. It was good. Highly recommend it. Yeah, and people can find your website. It's at amyssavorydish.com, and that's Amy with two E's. And you're all over social media, so I'll have all the links to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Instagram. Well, thanks again for being on the show and talking with us. And like I said, all of the links will be in the show notes at soundbitesrd.com. People can read more about your cancer journey and obviously get all your wonderful recipes and more information about meal prep at your site at amysavorydish.com and connect with you on social media. So thanks again for being on the show, Amy. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Next, we're going to talk about physical strength, mental strength, and cattle ranching. My guest needs no introduction but I will give you one anyway. He is Lance Picus. He is best known for being the cowboy ninja on NBC's show, American Ninja Warrior. Welcome to the show, Lance. Thanks for having me, Melissa. I'm so excited to talk with you. And my 11-year-old son is really bummed that he has to be in school today. It's his first full day of school, and he would love to be sitting next to me talking with you. But we are huge fans And I know that you have a great story to share, and I want to learn more about you and share that with our listeners. So I know that you've been ranching since you were about, well, you you became interested in it when you were about 18 years old. I know you met your lovely wife, Heather, at college and kind of fell in love with her and her family and the ranch and everything pretty quickly. Tell us a little bit about that. And also, uh, what did you study in college? And what a lot of people don't know is like, I don't have a ranching background growing up as a kid. You know, my family, we always lived in small towns and I've had a lot of friends and families that have been involved in it. Definitely taken in part of ranching activities growing up. And I always felt like I was kind of a part of it, but it wasn't really until after I got out of high school and started taking summer jobs on the ranch. And then of course I met my beautiful wife and you know, at 18, you can be really influenced by girls and stuff. So, you know, I really got entranced with the ranching community and her family and just the good values that they were showing me and, and being being a part of, basically. And we started getting very active on the ranch. She was very excited to show me, like, exactly what they do, you know, not only during the summer, you know, riding range and checking springs and working with the cows, but we'd come home during the winter when we were at college and help calve. And everything. So it just led into everything. And after we graduated, we moved back there permanently and just really started building our own herd and started doing our own thing um, along with her parents' help. And it's been a great experience. And we're going on about 12, 13 years now of being involved in ranching and being involved with the cattle business and stuff. So it's been a great experience. Yeah. And I think you just recently celebrated your 10 year wedding anniversary, right? 10 years, uh, August uh, 8th. It was our 10 year anniversary, which is, which cool. It's one of those big milestones you definitely hit and you kind of look back and see where you've came from and, you know, hopefully you'd be inspired to where you're going and stuff. So absolutely. And you have two beautiful children, a little boy and a little girl, and they're very active with you on the ranch. And we're going to talk about your family a little bit more, but yeah, I was curious what you studied in college. So, you know, I started off just taking undergrad stuff, not sure what I exactly want to, wanted to do, not coming from the ranching background. I never really thought of ranching as going to be my full-time permanent job, but I really liked outdoor activities, being involved, um, especially learning about rangeland and the ecosystem and ecology. I jumped into environmental science and didn't quite enjoy the, you know, the, the office and policy work as much. Mm-hmm and enjoyed more of the science aspect of it. So I ended up uh, getting a degree in Bachelor's of Science of Natural Resource Sciences. 
Interesting. And I'm sure that comes in very handy now. It does, you know, and just being able to, you know, identify veg and knowing what's going on, especially when we're out on the range, we range on about 10,000 acres of Bureau of Land Management ground. And we work directly with the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service as well when we're doing that to make sure we're doing things right, having the cows on there, the, you know, the allotment we're supposed to make sure we're not overgrazing or undergrazing and really working with the land. And it definitely helps having that background and being able to communicate and, and know, you know, the science behind everything. Yes. And I think it's interesting because I think a lot of people have this misconception that ranches and cattle, they're using up the land or they don't really go hand in hand with environmentally sustainable. But you know, you have a a different perspective. And I'd like you to share a little bit more. Um, And I did have an in-depth conversation with Dr. Sarah Place from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association about sustainability, which I'll link to in my show notes. But I'd love to hear from your perspective as a rancher and with a natural science, natural resources degree. Tell us a little bit more about how you care for the land and the animals. What a lot of people don't realize is as ranchers and farmers, we rely on the ground. We rely on the land and and the environment all around. So it does us no good to go out and just overuse it, destroy it, because it's it's not something we just want to use for our generation. We want to be able to hand it down to the next generation, the next generation. The more you learn about ecology and how ecosystems work and how everything is just this constant circle and flow, Grasslands are a huge part of our environment, especially in the U.S., but, you know, across the world. And the grass needs correct nutrients and and stuff to be able to grow. And if you don't resupply it with the nutrients it needs, it's just not going to be healthy. Things like cows are a great way to help manage those rangelands. Mm -hmm. They're putting uh, nutrients back in the soil. And the way we do it a lot of times is we, you know, we start off low in the fertile grounds and and then work our way up. And it'd be the same way as like, you know, natural herds of buffalo or elk, you know, following the snow line up as it's moving up. And you're basically taking the nutrients from the fertile ground down below because everything flows downhill. Water flows downhill, nutrients flow downhill. And you're basically the only way to naturally bring that back up is is animals. So we kind of try to mimic nature and the way the way nature would do things. It's just really cool to kind of see things. And a lot of times it is trial and error, you know, the scientific method going in. You can see when things are overused or underused and you try to make adjustments year after year and try to figure out that correct number of cows to have out there and the correct amount of time to have them out there. We're constantly, you know, fencing off springs and and making sure, you know, they're not in there and making sure, you know, if fences are down that we get the cows moved where they need to and fixing the fence lines. And it's a constant ever going overgoing deal. And I think a lot of people don't realize is as ranchers and farmers, you know, most people have an education in a science, whether it's an ag and animal science or Mm -hmm. natural resource sciences. And we're, we're using the resources we have. We're taking soil samples. We're doing blood work on our animals and make sure, you know, see if they're deficient in any nutrients or minerals or anything like that. I think a lot of people just think, you know, some rednecks out here just doing whatever we are and just you know, winging it, not using, you know, any science, you know, behind our what we're doing. Yeah, there's a lot of science. And there's a lot of business, you have to know a lot about running a business and the technology and everything. And I know you speak a lot about this on social media. So I'll be sure to include links to your Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and the show notes as well. But let's talk about strength. So as a rancher, and of course, as the cowboy ninja, you know, you really embody physical strength. But strength is not just physical. There's also mental strength that you talk about this a lot. So tell us how you define strength and what it means to be physically strong and mentally and emotionally strong. Those are great points. Yeah, it's easy to see that physical strength when I'm, you know, on the American Ninja Warrior course doing what seems to be near impossible obstacles or, you know, on the ranch moving hay or carrying a calf that needs carried to his mom. It's easy to see that physical strength, but what you don't really see is that mental strength, being able to problem solve, being able to problem solve your way through an obstacle or seeing obstacles people are falling on and trying to, you know, mentally pick out why that's happening. Or, you know, when things go wrong on the ranch and you got to be able to come up with solutions quickly, at least mitigate the problem and then find a final solution. There's a lot of mental strength that goes along with all that stuff. And I think it's kind of a full circle when you think about it, when you're physically strong, 
sometimes your physical strength can carry you through when you're mentally, you know, just not there. But when you're mentally strong and you physically can't do something, you got to mentally think through it. It really helps. It's all nothing if you're not emotionally there. An emotional strength is re- really important. If you're constantly doubting yourself, if you don't think you're going to be able to make it through an obstacle, more than likely you're not. If you think about failure more than success, you're more like you're going to fail. Yeah, that's self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> exactly. You know, I do a lot of, you know, motorcycle riding out in the in the mountains and, and horseback riding. And, you know, you can come to like some really tight spots where it's like you got to really concentrate. If you like look at that rock that you're trying to avoid and concentrate on avoiding that rock and you stare at that rock, you're probably going to hit that rock. <laughs> But if you like mentally look at that rock and then kind of look past it, and but know that it's there and know that what you got to do, you're going to avoid that rock and get through those tight situations. And, you know, the same, same thing with life. If you focus on that obstacle in front of you, if you focus too much on it and just stare at it, you're probably going to hit it and you're probably going to fall. Hmm. Yeah, I was thinking focus while you were talking. Yeah, and that can work for you and against you. You really need to be focused physically and mentally. With that emotional strength too, a lot of things have come in that help you. You know, you got family and community strength that can really help support you when you need it. And if you don't have those people giving you those good vibes and helping you through those situations, more likely you are likely to doubt yourself. So being able to, you know, like have dinners around the dinner table and talk about what has happened to your day and what's going on and like talk about your fears and your doubts with somebody and it helps you talk through things and helps you get through those those situations that, you know, it's, it's hard to do everything alone. It all goes hand in hand. And, and I really like how you explained when you're more physically strong, then that sort of takes over. But when you're not as physically strong, the mental and the emotional has to sort of step up to pull you through that. You talk a lot about pushing through and persevering. And certainly we see this when you're competing as the cowboy ninja. Tell us about how strength factors into with food fueling your strength and nutrition and, of course, beef. I know you are fueled by beef or powered by beef, I think is your tagline. Tell us how that fits in. And maybe, you know, you mentioned having dinner time with your family. And I have a Do More With Dinner initiative where I really talk a lot about the importance of family meals and really that the conversations, it's not just about the food. So how does that look for you as far as the role of food in fueling your strength? You know, it's it's hard to underestimate how big of a factor food and nutrition has an impact on your whole life, on your whole aspect of, of strength. And I think you know, and most of your audience knows how important fueling yourself correctly is. You want to, you know, make sure you're getting in not only the right calories, but the right type of calories and the right type of, you know, enough fats and enough protein and enough of those, all those micronutrients as well, you know, that help fuel. And not, I've always been a big fan of, of whole foods diets, just because, you know, the less processed stuff you eat, the more whole foods you eat, the more likely you're going to be getting all that extra little stuff that's going to help you digest and help you really absorb everything that you need. When you try supplementing too much of this or too much of that, sometimes, you know, you're taking too much and you're not getting enough of this or enough of that to really even fully absorb everything. So if you can really try to eat as whole and as wholesome as possible, you know, it's better. But I also, like you were saying, food to me is more than food. It's the social gatherings. Mm-hmm. It's the being around your family. So a lot of times people get so so strict that they lose that mental, emotional strength because they're too afraid to go out to hang out with their friends because they're not, you know, afraid of going out to dinner and not eating what they need to do. You know, there's a lot of social aspect that can really be beneficial to food. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, sitting around the table and just eating with your family and, and talking about your day and, and everything else. It's very, very important. And a lot of the times, you know, you'll go to community barbecues or, you know, block parties or something like that, some kind of event for a purpose, maybe the sports team or celebrate something or birthday party. And you go there for an event, but then you tend to stick around because the food's good, the company's good, you know, the vibe's good and, and everything like that. So I think it's just all one big circle and it's, it's just so important. Yeah, food really does connect us and it's very powerful in that role. I know that uh, you get a lot of questions about what's it like to be the cowboy ninja. 
I'm curious. And first, I have to tell you, whenever I watch American Ninja Warrior, I am so uptight and nervous. I like have my hands over my eyes. I'm peeking through my fingers. I'm squealing. It's so stressful when I watch it. My family can't even watch it with me. They're like, you got to go in the other room, mom. You're stressing everybody out. So I know that you train a lot for that. And I want to ask you a few questions about that. But I'm really curious if you were active as a child or a teenager, it almost seems like you could have been a gymnast. So I'm curious when you started being active, what types of activities you may have done and then how did that lead to American Ninja Warrior? Yeah. So growing up as a kid, I was definitely very active. Um, I spent a lot of time outdoors, you know, riding a bike and, you know, fishing and, and, and just running around and just being with friends out in the woods. But my, my dad was also really big into sports. He was mainly more into the team sports. So he really pushed like, you know, football, baseball and, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I kind of tended to gravitate more towards the individual sports. Uh, I was really big into, you know, like uh, wrestling and track. And wrestling actually is probably one of the most biggest influences on me. I wrestled a little bit in college as well and um, all throughout high school. And, you know, I probably would have been a pretty good gymnast. It just <laughs> wasn't really a thing growing up in, in my area and stuff like that. Right. I definitely respect gymnasts and everything they do. I think wrestling was probably my biggest influence as far as a sports background go, just teaching me mental toughness and physically pushing through. And it's one of those things where you can't really blame anyone else for your failures. It's you out there and, and only you. So if something goes wrong, you, you got to kind of look back on yourself and reflect on yourself. Yeah, you're almost competing with yourself or trying to get those, what is it, the personal records or personal bests? Yeah. And ultimately, you know, you have an opponent in wrestling. So you gotta, you, you know, like when you're training, you gotta like, I just don't know how he's training or you're like, how hard is he pushing? So you, you want to constantly be pushing yourself harder than your opponent. The cool thing about Ninja Warrior is it's very individual, but we're, we're all very supportive. It's a very supportive community because when it comes down to it, it, it's ultimately you versus the obstacles. And that's a way different mental aspect than I've had in any other team sport or individual sport I've ever had. The, the fact that, you know, we'll come back and give each other advice. You know, we might want a faster time than, you know, some of our friends and, you know, be like, hey, I did a faster. Uh, but it's like, ultimately, we want our friends to be able to go hit that buzzer too or move on to the next round. And so we can move on to the next stage together and, and enjoy those experiences together. Oh, that's really good to hear. So you're giving each other tips like, I know, like you said, there's a lot of problem solving. And when I watch, and I think it's this last season, I saw the video on your Facebook page where you had three attempts up that terribly high wall. And I didn't think you were going to make it. <laughs> and you did. And I was just like, oh, my God. And so, you I wasn't know, quite sure if I was either. I was kind of debating after my first two attempts if that was a good idea. <laughs> it was like, oh, my gosh, is he going to do it? And I, I could see on your face. That's where like the mental strength had to come in. And you just it was almost mind over matter. So where are things now with the, the competition with American Ninja Warrior? Right now is kind of more off season for us. National finals film in June. Training will probably start kicking up December, January, because we'll start filming again, uh, you know, March, April. So you're definitely going to do it. I plan on it. You know, I've done it eight years now. Um, <sighs> it's one of those things that uh, I enjoy doing, my family enjoys doing. My kids are starting to get old enough, they're really starting to get a concept of it and figuring it out. So mm -hmm. it, it's fun to see them get excited about it and kind of almost come and want to train and stuff. So, you know, as long as I can stay healthy and then stay active, you know, it's one of those things that keeps me going and I truly enjoy it. So as long as it stays fun for me, I, I'm, I'm planning on, uh, you know, coming back as long as they'll have me. Excellent. Well, we look forward to seeing you again on the next season then. Now, I know you get a lot of questions about ranching and raising cattle. I know we've talked about some of this, but I always like to ask, what are some of the biggest misconceptions or the most common questions you get about cattle, the environment, just ranching in general that you think you know, people need to hear? Yeah, especially with, uh, you know, traveling for beef is what's for dinner. I've done a lot of big expos, especially in like bigger metropolitan cities. I definitely get a lot of questions. And, you know, depending on where you're at in the country, you know, like each operation is different. We're using the resources we have. Each area, you know, it's, you know, the grass grows differently, different types of grasses and, you know, different climate and stuff. But, you know, I think probably the biggest misconception is, is people really talk about uh, you know, the beef industry is this one big, huge corporation that's owned by like one or two or three companies. 
that's probably the biggest thing is what I try to really correct with people is like cattle is such a unique animal that it, you need a lot of little small pieces to put everything together. I think uh, the overall statistics, I think 93% of the ranches in the U.S. are family owned and operated ranches. Mm-hmm. And I think the average herd size is like 50. So, you know, there's a lot of fluctuation there because there's people running thousands and, you know, people running small, you know, one or two head. But, you know, the average herd size is 50. It's so a lot of small pieces moving together. You know, you got the cow calf operators, which are calving out the calves and, you know, letting the moms raise them. And then you got, you got a lot of farmers. They buy those calves and use them as backgrounders to help clean up fields after harvest because, you know, you can only clean up so much after harvest. There's a lot of stuff that's, you know, not even edible for humans anyways that cattle are great for upcycling and going down and cleaning all that up. And for people who don't know what upcycling is, I wrote a blog post on it. I'll link to that in the show notes. Um, It's really cool. Yeah. And then I I get a lot of questions about, you know, there's a lot of labeling out there and a lot of people get confused with the labeling, you know, the difference between grain finish and grass finish and organic or naturally raised. So, you know, I try to give them as much info as I can. But I, I also, you know, people think, you know, if something's grain finished, that it's just spent its whole life in a feedlot and only ate grain. And I try to explain to them that, no, even if it's grain finish, like almost 80% of its life, it was still out on grass and rangeland and pasture. It's it's only that small little portion that they're moved into a feedlot. They still fed portions of, you know, forage and grass and stuff like that, but they just get higher protein to help the finishing process more. And a lot of the times too, they're using byproducts from harvest for every hundred pounds of plants that are made to the grocery store, there's about 37 pounds of waste that's produced. That could be bad for the environment and go into a landfill, but instead the cattle are eating it. Exactly. And that's the upcycling. So they eat things that we can't and they turn it into nutrient-rich protein. Exactly. Well, and I think some of those terms too, like people hear grass-fed or grain-fed, they don't realize all cows are grass-fed some cows are grass finished. So to your point, I think some of the terminology just makes it confusing for people. Yeah. And then people start carrying over, you know, terms from, you know, like the, you know, poultry market, you know, like, oh, is it free range (laughs) and stuff like that? And I'm like, well, that doesn't really pertain to the cattle market. You know, it's it's more grass finished or grain finished, but, you know, technically, you know, most, a lot of, you know, a lot of cow calf and uh, backgrounders, they use, you know, range. I think, there's big, big misconception on land use, you know, and you see a lot of propaganda on like, you know, it takes this much land for a meat diet and this much land for, you know, a vegan or vegetarian diet, which is true, but it's it's misconceived in, in, in a way because our home ranch between all the places we're leasing is around a thousand acres. That's, you know, what we're farming and bringing the cows home during the winter. But we range on 10,000 acres of Bureau of Land Management land. That's public ground that can't be used for anything else. And it's grass and sagebrush. You and couldn't grow strawberries in that. You couldn't grow. It's too steep and right. the terrain's not good, but you don't have enough water to do anything with it anyways. And even if you could, like it's public ground, you couldn't do anything. Mm-hmm. But we're able to you know, lease it out and put our cows out there all summer long. So that 10,000 acres would go into our statistic for you know running 300 heads. So yeah, of course your numbers are going to jump up, but it's like, you wouldn't be able to use that ground for anything else. So I think I think those numbers are just misleading, if anything else, when you start looking at land use, for ca- especially for cattle. Right. And you mentioned different types of land and different geographic locations. You can do different things on those pieces of land, and they have different inputs required as far as the soil, the water usage, and so on. And, and yeah, I think a lot of times when it, we get into the sustainability conversation, we do start ending up comparing apples and oranges. And like you said, it might be accurate, but misleading or not meaningful at the least, because it's not really comparing apples to apples. You're missing a lot of variables. And a hot topic right now is probably, you know, the rainforest and the fires going on. I don't know much about, you know, the rainforest and fire ecology. I know it's, you know, big time fire season there anyways. But, you know, if that's a concern for people, they need to be supporting more local raised stuff. U.S. beef has no effect on stuff that's grown down there. And a matter of fact, there's government agencies that have big programs that are cutting back forest here in the, like the Intermountain West, cutting back juniper trees and forests 
to help sage grouse habitat and stuff like that. So it's exact opposite. You know, we've suppressed fire so much up here. Trees are encroaching on critical wildlife habitat. Interesting. It's interesting to look at all the perspectives and try to look at where, you know, where you're at geographically. Yeah. And like you said, there's so many different variables. The more I learn about sustainability, the more I want to learn more because it brings up more interesting points. So if we were at your dinner table with your family and we were doing more with dinner, I'm curious, what are some of your favorite beef recipes? You mentioned you, you work with beef, it's what's for dinner, and I'm on the Beef Expert Bureau. But what are some of your favorite recipes? Do you do any of the cooking? Do you get the kids in the kitchen? And what might a dinner look like at your house? A lot of people actually know because we have the expression on the show. So my wife suffers from an autoimmune disease called uh, multiple sclerosis. So it limits her mobility a lot. I end up doing a lot of a lot of the housework and a lot of the a lot of the cooking and stuff like that, which you know, I enjoy prepping and preparing dinner and stuff for the family. You know, I always try to get my kids involved, you know, and it really depends on, you know, what's going on and how things are going. We're really big into crock pot recipes, something you can throw in and come back after a busy day and have something ready and pull out. We do a lot of hamburger meals. There's some great recipes on beef it's what's for dinner. I think one of my kids' favorite is a chili mac. Mm-hmm. beef recipe. I personally like tri-tip and cut nice and thinly. Um, there's a great garden grill tri-tip recipe on beef. It's what's for dinner as well. And with that, it's cool, especially during the summer. Me and, me and my family like the garden. So, you know, I'll get the kids out actually picking some of the vegetables that we're going to be putting in with the tri-tip. And, you know, some of the vegetables maybe they wouldn't touch, you know, in a million years. The fact that they helped grow it mm-hmm. and they picked it, able to cut it up and prepare it, they're more likely to put it on their plate and, and, and give it a try, which is which is always cool and, and fun to get the kids. Yeah. You know, try to start them young, thinking about health, nutrition, and stuff And enjoying like their food, right, and, and helping raise it. So I love it. You're ranching all day, then you come to your garden and you pick the vegetables for dinner. It's great. And the, some of the recipes that you mentioned, uh, yeah, I'll link to those. I know that there's also uh, buffalo-style beef tacos. I haven't tried that one yet, but I want to. So I'll link to those recipes on Beef It's What's for Dinner. Oh, I'd recommend that recipe. It's, it's really good. My kids love that one too. Well, is there anything else that you wanted to share with us about strength, about physical strength, mental strength, cattle ranching? I know you're very proud of the work that you do and we're grateful for the work that you do. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us as we wrap up? Nutrition, health, environment, they're all complicated subjects. There's not always a definitive right or wrong answer. And especially with diet and nutrition, I think, you know, everyone's so different. Our makeups are so different. We come from, you know, different heritages and stuff like that. I think people need to be their best own advocate and really, you know, use their body as an experiment that they're trying to improve upon. Um, Like I said, my wife suffers from MS. so We're constantly messing with her diet and trying to figure out what works for her, you know, and different types of diets and stuff. But ultimately, once you find something out, you know, that works for you and you feel like, it, you know, it's working for you, you're more likely to turn it into a lifestyle, not just a diet that you're going to do for, you know, four to six weeks or something like that to try to lose a few pounds. It's, It's something that needs to be constantly you need to be thinking about not let it hinder you in a way where you can't enjoy life and go on vacation and go to those parties and stuff like that. You just need to be your best advocate and really, really try to work, work yourself into a good situation where you can keep it long term. I love that. You're, you're so right. It's not simple. It is complex. And we are all different and have different needs. And, and I, I love the idea and I support it 100% that sometimes we need to try different things and see what works for us. And it might not work the same for our neighbor. And Thank you for sharing about your wife. I know that you did recently go public with that information and, you know, we're thinking of her and, you know, talk about that strength. I know you really see so much strength in her and within your family and I know you're supporting each other. So we wish you the best with that. And again, thank you so much for being on the show and for all the great work you do. And we will continue to follow you and I'll be watching through my fingers as I um, see you compete next time. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Take care. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. Thanks for staying tuned. As promised, here are some announcements from my partner, the American Association of Diabetes Educators. AADE 20 Call for Abstracts. You can submit your abstracts for the AADE 2020 conference, which will be held in Atlanta, Georgia, Friday, August 14th through Monday, August 17th. Submissions can be submitted online 
the deadline for education and research sessions is October 21st, and the deadline for posts is June 30th, 2020. AADE also has a new podcast. I'm so excited about this. AADE is proud to bring you this new podcast for your personal and professional growth. It's called The Huddle, Conversations with the Diabetes Care Team, and it features perspectives, issues, and updates to inform your practice and elevate your role. Each episode dives into a variety of topics that directly impact your work in diabetes, prediabetes, and cardiometabolic care. Everything from advocacy to technology to new ways to support your clients. The podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. And finally, AADE has developed several new handouts to help you address issues and manage them. There's handouts on diabetic ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar syndrome, sick day management for adults, and sick day management for children. You can find all of this information at diabeteseducator.org, and I will also have direct links to all of this information in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com forward slash 128. Thanks again for listening. Have a great day. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com music by Dave Burke.